Good morning, everybody. So we have been talking about judges in this series. I've been covering Gideon. We covered Gideon or Judges 6 and 7, right? We learned how when Gideon was first summoned by God or called by God, he was very hesitant. He was very doubtful. Then we move into how Gideon was actually successful in battle, which was chapters or chapter 7. Now we're going to move into chapter 8. And I like chapter 8 because after all the success that Gideon had, we see what happens whenever people be people and they forget where their victory and their strength and their success comes from, which is Christ. So today we're going to talk about pride. We're going to talk about how pride comes before the fall, right? Back, back in, in the 1800s, when Napoleon was going through his, his world conquests, he had pretty much taken over all, everything that there was. Most of the countries were under his feet. And the last remaining country that he had to defeat was Europe, right? Well, at that time, the Russians, you know, the Tsar Alexander II was one of his allies. But you see, Napoleon didn't like the Tsar because he felt that he was too independent mindset, right? So what Napoleon's plan to defeat Europe was to boycott all their supply lines so that they, they to pretty much starve them out. The Tsar wasn't, the, the Tsar didn't like that plan and didn't agree. So Napoleon decided, well, I'll tell you what, well, now you're one of my enemies too. And so Napoleon decided to go against the Russians and, and suffocate and defeat them too. At this time, Napoleon had one of the greatest armies in the world. He had over 650,000 men in his army. They called it the great army. It took them five days just to pass by one spot when they were moving towards Russia. Well, here's what happened. Napoleon was so prideful in his army and so confident that they would win. He didn't supply his army at all with winter gear. And they're fighting in Russia, right? Russia. Well, he was so prideful that he thought that the battle would be, long, would be won before the snow even fell. Well, guess what happened? In the beginning of the battle, a giant winter storm hit and took out the majority of his army. He had the tuck tail run back to Paris because there was a coup that was happening because of people were so sick and tired of Napoleon's pride. And that led to what we now know as pretty much his downfall. After that, there was no more victories. He ends up going to a different island, being cast, cast away because of his pride. And so when we look at chapter eight, pretty much the same thing happens to Gideon, but not just to Gideon, but to the Israelites too. So there's a couple of things that we can learn from chapter eight. So I want you to write these things down. I have seven. I highly doubt we'll be able to get to all seven. So I'm just going to cover the main ones. But thus far in the study of Gideon's life, we've seen his responses to the Lord's call to defeat the enemy. At first, Gideon was full of questions and doubt. But then he grew in his faith, believed God's promises, and led his army to victory. In Judges 8, the account focuses on Gideon's responses to various people after he'd won the battle, and it tells us how he handled some difficult situations. After being routed by Gideon's 300 men in Judges 7, the kings of Midian fled south. Gideon's men pursued them all the way to the other side of the Jordan River. So as we learned during chapter 7, they win. They, they, they defeat the Midianites. They beheaded some of, or they killed some of the leaders, some of the military leaders. They actually killed them at the same place that Gideon was hiding the wine press, right? Well, now the kings have fled. Battles lost, kings have fled. Gideon and his men are now going after the king because they know to have full victory in this battle, they got to get the kings. So that's what we pick up in Judges 8, 1 through 3. So this is the first thing that we can learn from this story. Write this down. Pride can lead to jealousy. So Judges 8, 1 through 3, then the men of Ephraim said to him, what is this thing you have done to us, not calling us when you went to fight against Midian? And they contended with him vigorously. But he said to them, what, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of, of, of Abazer? God has given the leaders of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb into your hands. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. Let's break this down. What's happening right now? Well, here's what's happening. The men of Ephraim joined in the fight against Midian when Gideon called out to them. That's Judges 7, 24 through 25. But here's the deal. 
They joined the fight. Gideon didn't ask them to join the fight. They joined on their own. The Ephraims were upset that Gideon did not call them before the battle started. Gideon's initial call for help went up to the tribes of, of Manasseh, which was Gideon's own tribe, Asher, Zabalom, and Naphtali. That's in Judges 6. Right. So what's happening is that is the men of Ephraim are looking at, at Gideon and, and they're upset because Gideon never called them to battle. They went on their own. And so they're looking at Gideon and asking him, why didn't you call us to battle? Here's where the pride comes from. So we're going to back up to Genesis for a little bit. Just before his death, Jacob issued a blessing that switched the birth order of Joseph's children. I remember that, right? Thus, he put Ephraim before Man- Manasai. That's, that's Genesis 48, 13. It's also in 17 through 20, 41 through 50, 51 in Numbers. This, however, created jealousy amongst the tribes of Manasai and pride in the tribe of Ephraim. Joshua, which we all know who Joshua is, right? He's a hero to the, uh, he was a hero of the faith and success of the Moses. Well, guess what? Guess where Joshua comes from? Guess what tribe Joshua was from? He's from the Ephraim tribe. Not only that, when they were moving the ark, the tribe, Ephraim tribe, was was also selected and called to guard the ark in the territory. That's Joshua 18.1. Right, so all these facts lead to this pride the child of Ephraim is having. So they're looking at and 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 also this. So before this, David issues. I think it's in Second Samuel. David issues a decree where whenever uh, you have military victory, you share in the spoils. The spoils get shared equally, no matter who had what, no matter what did what. We're all going to share in the spoils. We're going to divide it equally. That hasn't happened yet. So at this point. Whoever wins the victory, you get the spoils. You get the you get everything that you take from the enemy. We're not sharing anything. If you didn't show up to the battle, you don't get the spoils. The tribe of Ephraim were there. They came later, right? They're the ones who killed the military leaders at the wine press. So they're upset because one, they weren't called into battle. And two, it doesn't say this specifically in scripture, but if you look at the historical context and break it back to the time frame that was going on back then, they're dealing with that too. They're not getting any of the spoils because they weren't there. They showed up at the end. So they're very upset. Their pride is hurt. But here's what I want us to pay attention to is how Gideon responded. He controlled himself and treated them with kindness. He didn't challenge their pride. Instead, he soothed their pride by complimenting them and giving them the recognition that they seemed to crave. He told them that their capturing of Orb and Zeb, which is the leaders that they killed at the wine press, was a greater feat than anything the men had done. Right? So they're in their prideful situation. How often have we been dealing with people in a prideful situation? And we have two options. I can either A, respond in my own pride, or I can B, respond how Christ calls us to respond, which is love, grace, and mercy. How does Gideon respond? We can go back up to the verse. He says, but he said, what have I done in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has given the leaders of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb into your hands. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger subsided with what he said. Proverbs 15.1, write this down. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Right? So when we are dealing with pride, not just in ourselves, but with other people, it's important to remember how God calls us to respond with love, mercy, and grace. So application. When you are doing something for the Lord, you can expect to be criticized by those who do nothing. Who's dealt with that? When the attacks come, and they will, we should do like Gideon and exercise control over our emotions. Application two. Instead of getting sidetracked by our critics... If y'all need me to repeat, just let me know, and I'll repeat this. 
Instead of getting sidetracked by our critics, we must keep our eyes on the tasks we have been assigned by God. That's Hebrews 12, 2, Ephesians 6, 6. Hebrews 12, 2, Ephesians 6, 6. You see, we have a calling on our lives, right? And if you look at how Jesus dealt with this calling, there are multiple times during his ministry when he would go to different cities and he's being bombarded by people to heal them, heal their sicknesses, heal their injuries, heal their mindsets. And there was multiple occasions when Jesus looked at them and said, where I'm going and what I'm going to do, my purpose is far greater than what I need to do right now. You're asking me to heal your broken leg. You're asking me to heal your sickness. I'm letting you know that where I'm going, which was the cross, which was the crucifixion, which was to pay the price for our sins, is far greater than your little boo-boo right now. You may not understand it. You don't get it right now, but that's where I'm going. So in essence, is what he's saying is he kept his eyes on the task because he knew I'm going to save your soul. And saving your soul and saving your spirit is far better than saving your little broken bone right now. Point two. Write this down. Pride can lead to lack of faith. Pride can lead to lack of faith. We see this in Judges 8, 4 through 9. Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan and crossed over. So they've gone through that and they've dealt with that from their great, they're wonderful. Now they're continuing to pursue the kings of the Midianites. Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan and crossed over, weary, yet pursuing. They were tired, they were hungry, they were worn out, but there's, they just got done fighting a battle and now they're chasing these dudes across the other side of the Jordan, which we'll, we'll learn here why that's important. He said to the men of Succoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who are following me for they are weary. And I am pursuing Zabah and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. The leaders of Succoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hands that we should give bread to your army? Question mark. Gideon said, all right, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will thrash your bodies with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. He went up from there to Penel who spoke similarly who spoke similarly to them and the men of Penuel answered him just as the men of Succoth had answered so he spoke also to the men of Penuel saying when i return safely i will tear down this tower let's break this down this is just a side note by the way it has nothing to do with the theology of this i just thought it was really cool but who knows who knows what's significant about Penuel p e n u b l Penuel that's where jacob wrestled with god Just a side note, has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I just thought it was cool. So let's break this down. What's happening? So Succoth was part of the territory of God, Gad, in the Jordan Valley to the north of the territory of Reuben and to the south of the half tribe of Menasai. That's Joshua 13, 24 through 28. Here's what's happening. So back back in the day, we're going to cross-reference, jump back to Numbers. They gave up their rights. So this particular part of the territory, right, the Reuben and South of the tribe of Menasai, the Succoth, they gave up their right to claim land that God had promised within Israel. This is in Numbers 32, 19. For we will not have an inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance has fallen to us on this side of the Jordan towards the east. So what's happening? This particular tribe, the Succoth, they symbolized the person who hears the good news of Christ, but still longs for the things of the world over his kingdom. They were prideful in themselves and didn't feel as close to the other tribes as they should have. While others were risking their lives, the people of Gad were doing nothing. The lack of faith of the Succothites and Gideon and Gideon's God you, you, you got to think, they already knew about getting 300 men to feet and over 100,000 men. They had to have known. Word, word travels fast. What proof did they need? To reiterate, they feared men, not God, and so lived an even greater fear of reprisal from the Midianites. So what's happening? They're looking at Gideon and his God, and they already gave up their right to the lands. They don't, they don't want no part of what God's calling them to do. They think, we're, we're good here. We don't want any part of what they're doing over there. 
we're good here. We like it here. We like what the what, what, what the land's producing. We, we we like what's happening on this side of the Jordan. We're good, Jesus. We're good, God. We don't want our inheritance. Give it to them. We want no part of them. We're prideful in ourselves. Right? So because of that, that lack of faith in the Gideon and Gideon's God has led them to where they're more fearful of the Midianites than their faith in God. Because they're literally looking at Gideon, and that was a premise of Judges 8, 4 through 9. They're looking at Gideon saying, have you defeated these kings yet? Because if not, we're not going to help you. Why? Because they were afraid of the reprisal that would happen if they did feed Gideon's men and they didn't win. So let's say the Gideon and his men didn't find the kings, the kings end up winning. Then what happens? They're afraid of the reprisal. And actually, again, we go back to the historical context. You look at what's going on back in this time. A lot of scholars, some, many scholars believe that the Succothites were even in cahoots with the Midianites. They believe that one of the reasons that they didn't give them bread wasn't just because they were fearful, but because they were working with the Midianites. And now they know if we give Gideon's men bread, they're really going to come down on us. So write this down. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Right? So all that said, how can we apply this to our lives? Point one, do not let fear of the world distract you from your faith in God. That's Ephesians 6, 10 through 11. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11. Point two, don't let pride keep you from walking in God's will for your life. Remember that the success that we have in our lives, anything that we do good has nothing to do with us. When we look at the book of James, and Jesus is given the parable of the vine. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Not apart from me, you can do some things. Apart from me, you might have troubles and struggles. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do not let your pride steal from you what God has for you. Please do not misinterpret me. I'm not saying that we follow Christ for blessings. That's truth. That's truth that's written in the Bible. But that's not why we follow Christ. We follow Christ simply because we love him so much that we want a relationship. From that relationship comes the successes according to his plan, not ours. A lot of Christians like to quote that verse, for all things come with the good, right? God, God takes everything that's in the world and, 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 and brings it to good, but they tend to want to leave out the rest of it. Anybody know what the rest of that verse says? For those who love him according to to his plan. So God's going to take what's good and what we find good might not be what God finds good. And what we find bad, God might see as good. Do not let your pride distract you or steal from you the calling and walk that God has for you. We got to move forward. Point three, we are definitely not getting into all seven. Pride can lead to a lack of forgiveness and vengefulness. You see this in Judges 8, 13 through 21. Pride can lead to a lack of forgiveness and vengefulness. After defeating the remaining Midianites, Gideon then retaliated against the Jewish citizens of Succoth by destroying it and killing every man in the city. You see that right here. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Succoth, here is Zeba and Zalmona about whom you taunted me by saying, do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give you bread to your exalt exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Succoth the lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Camille and killed the men of the town. So here's what's happening. Gideon felt that he had the right to retaliate against the people of Succoth. He first publicly flogged the leaders with whips made of thorns and briars. Then, unsatisfied with his torture, he killed both the leaders and every man in the city. His murderous rage was not of God. His actions were influenced by the devil to discredit God. Where is that point made? That's not just me talking, that's scripture. 
vengeance belongs to God alone. That's in Deuteronomy 32, 35. That's in Psalms 94, 1 through 2. Also in chapter 16 and 23. That's Romans 12, 17 and 19. And Hebrews 10, 30. And I can keep going. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, not us. And here's why, because we're going to get into it here in a second. Because Gideon also does the same thing to somebody else, but it's justified. And we're going to see why. The murder of innocent people is one of the six things that God hates. And the Bible uses that word, hate. I don't have time to go into the historical context or the Greek or the Hebrew translations. I highly suggest that you look it up yourself. Go into a software called logos.com. You can look up the, the translation of it because it gets so much deeper than what we believe the English translates hate. But here's the verse. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven, which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, the hands that sheds innocent blood. Not hands that sheds blood. Hands that sheds innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that runs rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies. And one who spreads strife among brothers. That's Proverbs 6, 16, 19 through 19. Side note. What does it mean when it says one who spreads strife amongst brothers? Again, this is something that God hates. You know what that means in, in our contemporary world terms? Gossip. God hates gossip. And I guarantee you, every single one of us in this room, to include myself, is guilty of gossip. So next time you find yourself wanting to gossip and want to talk about people behind their back, Remember, God hates that. Let's move on because we are running out of time. So, here's my point. Why didn't Gideon show the people of Succoth and Peniel the same kindness that he showed to the Ephraimites and simply forgive them for their offenses? I'll tell you. Ephraim was protecting their tribal pride. A sin, right? Pride's a sin, but not a costly one. Succoth and Peniel were rebelling against God's chosen leader and assisting the enemy at the same time. Theirs was the sin of, a, of hardness of heart towards their brethren and treason against the God of heaven. Of what good was it for Gideon and his men to risk their lives to, live, to deliver Israel if they had traitors right in their own nations? We're going to move So here's why I say it's different because we're going to just skip forward and move forward for time's sake, but they end up finding the leaders. They find the leader or they find, they, 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 they find the Kings and here's how Gideon deals with them. Then he asked Zeba and Zomano, what kind of men, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. Zeba and Zalmunna said, come do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camel's necks. Why is Gideon's response to the Zeba and Zalmunna different than his response to the Sekathites and Peniolites? Right, because with the Succothites and Peniolites, that was wrath, that was anger, that was vengeance. Right, he killed innocent people. He had no right to do that. God did not tell him to do that. He did it because he was mad and angry that they didn't feed his men. A lot of pride involved in that too. A lot of pride involved in that. You did not help me and my men, so now I'm gonna kill you all. God did not tell him to do that. But why is him beheading the kings different? He said, he, and he says why he does it. You killed my brother. You killed my brothers. Now I'm gonna kill you. We go back to the Old Testament for that. And again, this is Numbers 35, 9 through 34. If you don't believe me, write it down. Numbers 35, 9 through 34. According to the Mosaic law, the family was to avenge crimes like this by killing those responsible for the murder. There was no police system in the land, and each family was expected to track down and punish those who had murdered their relatives, provided the culprit was guilty. 
In the case of Zeba and Zulmana, the culprits were not only murderers, but also enemies of Israel. Right? So when we look at the Sekathites and the Peniolites, they were innocent. They did not kill Gideon's family. They were only guilty of one thing, not feeding them out of fear and pride. Zoba and Zomana, they murdered Gideon's brothers. So according to the Old Testament, according to the Mosaic law, Gideon had the right to go and kill them. And it was justified because now, like it says, we, again, the Lord hates spilling up innocent blood. According to the Mosaic law, Zeba and Zomana were not innocent. They were guilty of murder and they were enemies of Israel. So that's why it's different. I just thought that was really cool. But here's where Gideon went wrong. By taking the pagan crescent, crescent ornaments off the enemy leader's camels, Gideon was also claiming title to the royal power. Through all of these things, he became no better than the people he sought to be. Daniel Block, who he, he is the author, if you really want to get into exegesis and really breaking down scripture, I highly suggest looking up exegetical commentaries, right? Because they break it all down. There's one guy that I really like. His name is Daniel Block. He's the author of the New American Commentary, an exegetical and theological exposition of Holy Scripture. So he breaks down the exegesis of it, and then he also gives commentary on the theology of it. If you want that book, get with me. I'll give you the name, but I pulled a quote out of it. Daniel Block writes, Since Gideon launched his pursuit of Zeba and Zomana in 8.4, his actions follow the typical pattern of Oriental kings. One, He treated his subjects and countrymen ruthlessly. That's in verses 5, 9, 13 through 17. His actions were driven by a personal agenda rather than theological or rational ideas, right? That's whenever he slaughtered the Succothites and Peniolites. And three, he reacted to the death of his brothers as if they were royal assassinations requiring blood vigilance. And then he made ridiculous demands on his people. He looked at his son, who was a boy at the time, wasn't even a teenager. And said, kill these men. But do you know why? Side note, do you know why Zeba and Zemaniah taunted Gideon to kill them uh, to kill them themselves? Because back in those days, how you died mattered. They knew they were defeated, but they still wanted their legacy to live on. If they were killed by a small boy, their legacy would be tarnished. They'd go on for the rest of their history, for the rest of time, as the kings who were slaughtered by a bull. So they taunted Gideon to get him to do it themselves, and Gideon did. Gideon, side note. He claimed for himself the symbols of royalty taken from the enemy. So how do we apply this? One, let your actions be a light to all, even your enemies. You too are called to be a light to others. That's Matthew 5, 14. Two, you show this light by showing love to all even your enemies. Matthew 5, 4, 4, and Luke 6, 27 through 28. Matthew 5, 4, 4 says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How often do we find ourselves wanting to behave just like Gideon and take vengeance upon ourselves and allow our pride to keep us from behaving and walking in the light that God calls us to be? Love your enemies. The second greatest command God ever gave us was love others the way we love ourselves. That includes your enemies. Last point. I'm going to skip skip it all forward. Way too much. Pride leads to the failure to glorify God. Pride leads to the failure to glorify God. We see that in Judges 8, 33 through 35. So Gideon, at this point in time, I'm not going to read it. Go back and read it for yourselves. But at this point in time, Gideon was so popular that the Israelites asked him to set up a dynasty, something altogether new for the nation of Israel. Again, Israel has not had a king so far. They've had the judges who come through because God keeps giving them judges to teach them why they don't need a king and don't learn. But up until this point, they have not had a king. So they ask Gideon, will you be our king? We want you to lead us. Gideon responds. He rejects their generous offer purely on theological grounds. He reminds them that God is their king. He would not take the place of Jehovah 
Every Jew should have known that the mercy seat in the tabernacle was the throne of God from which he ruled in the midst of people. And again, this was prophesied. We go back to the Old Testament or we're in the Old Testament. We, we, we go back to Moses. Moses warned the Israel. To that here in a second because that's scripture so he rejects the throne however pride comes before the fall he lives just like a king in 29 through 32 it describes the lifestyle of a monarch not that of a judge or a retired army officer he was getting was wealthy one from the spoils of battle and two from the gifts of the people he had many wives and at least one concubine we all know what a concubine is the Midianites wore gold crescents either on the ear or the nose. That's in Genesis. And the Israelite soldiers would have quickly taken these valuable items as they gathered the spoilers. Gideon ended up with over 40 pounds of gold, plus the wealth he took from Zeba and Zomana. Right? And so even here, go back and read the scripture. Gideon even asked the Israelites, he says, well, I'm not going to take the throne, but if you want to give me some gold, I'll take it. So they did. They gave him all kinds of gold up to the point, get 40 pounds of it. Well, what does Gideon do with this 40 pounds of gold? He makes an effort. So an effort in Laman, it's pretty much, a, it's, like, it's like a statue, right? It, it, there, there's a lot of things that an effort could be, but and in, in, in for, for time's sake, it's pretty much a statue that they're going to worship. So, up until this point, Gideon, who's a man of faith, has led the Israelites with only 300 dudes in the victory against over 100,000 of men, right? He followed God. He followed God. He followed God. He gets victory. And then what happens? He falls into pride. And at this point, his pride doesn't just bring him down. Now he's led his people into worshiping an idolatry. The people, this is in verse 27, for Gideon made an effort and the people played the harlot. What does play the harlot mean? I'm going to tell you. In layman's terms, this meant that they stopped giving their true devotion to the Lord and used the effort for an idol. Right? So we break that. This, I want to break that down. So play the harlot, when you break it back down to Hebrew, it's Sana. I have no idea if I pronounce that the same, the, the right way, but it's Z-A-N-A-H. It's a verb meaning to fornicate, to prostitute, and refers to marital infidelity or unfaithfulness. It was a word used elsewhere in the Old Testament to describe prostitution. That's in Leviticus and Proverbs. Many of the uses of Zanai are figurative, describing Israel's, which is Jehovah's wife, commission of spiritual prostitution by having intercourse, so to speak, with other gods. Right? So when it says they played the harlot, they're literally, what it's saying in Scripture is they are having a spiritual marital affair in their relationship with God. Yeah. That, that gives a whole new meaning than just prostitution, right? They are prostituting their spirits. They're prostituting their minds. They are now in an affair in their relationship with God. But you look at this. This was a familiar pattern in Israel. Like Gideon, the Jews were too filled with pride to submit to God alone. Instead, they used their freedom to pursue after the idols that God had freed them from. How often do we do that? How often do we run back to the chains of bondage that Christ has freed us from because we find ourselves in struggle and seasons of turmoil and we run back to comfort? That's what's happening here. The Israelites continuously run back to their comfort, run back to their idols, but it gets worse. They don't just worship this effort that Gideon created. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to Baal. We learned about Baal through the entire history of Gideon. We learned about that in chapter six. They set up Baal as their God 
and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. And this isn't the first story of victory. This is Judges chapter 6 through 8. We've already been covering and digging deep all the other judges. It's this consistent pattern, right? God help me. God save us. We're in trouble. God gives us victory. Oh, let's go back to what we were doing in worship and false idols. We do that too. We can judge the Israelites all we want, but we do it too. I call it being an on-the-shelf Christian, right? God help me. I'm in trouble. I'm in struggle. Help, help, help. God helps me. Thank you, Jesus. And I take Jesus and I put him on the shelf. Because now we're not in the valley anymore. We're on a mountaintop. But then what happens? We find ourselves in a valley again. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble again. Need you, Jesus. Pull him off the shelf. Thank you. Help me, please. Help me, help me. And of course, God gives us success. He helps us. He's faithful. Bible says that. We find victory. Then what do we do? Put him back on the shelf. We are no different than the Israelites. But here's the application. Write this down. Application one. In everything you do, do for the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 30. In everything you do, do for the glory of God. How do you do that? I'm glad you asked. Point two. Remember that you work for God, not people. So work willingly, always. That's Colossians 3, 23. We get so wrapped up into the world. We get so wrapped up into our career, our job, the struggles, the turmoil, even the good parts of life, that we forget who we work for. We work for Jesus. You were not put on this earth for a nine to five. You're not put on this earth to, to serve ourselves. We're going to get to that in a second. We're not put on this earth to do what we want, to live our lives the way we want. We work for Jesus, and he gives us the mission. The mission is simple, the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and create disciples of all nations, baptizing them in my name and the Holy Spirit and growing the kingdom. That's our job. That's our job. Grow God's kingdom. It's that simple. We love God, and we love people. The, the, the two greatest commandments he ever gave us. Love God, love people. And then we take that mission, we take that vision, and we utilize the lifestyle that we're called to live according to scripture to create disciples. And I know I've talked about it before. I'm going to talk about it again. Again, historical context, original language. When you take, make disciples and break it back down to the Greek language, the Greek language does not use the word make. That's not what's being said. What it's saying is live your life as a disciple, and through that, other disciples are naturally created. We create disciples by living our lives according to Scripture. We create disciples by simply loving people the way God tells us to, whether we like them or not. Point three, focus on pleasing God, not people, for we are the servants of Christ. Yes, we're the children of Christ. Yes, we belong into his family. But recognize the word that's utilized here because it's utilized. That's Galatians 1.10. This is not me saying this. Galatians 1.10 says, we are servants of Christ. It's not our jobs to appease people. It's not our jobs to people please. And some of y'all have a really hard time with that because you're people pleasers. It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's part of your personality. Just if that's you, recognize it. What it's not saying is we should go hate people and treat people like crud. No. By pleasing God and serving Christ, we naturally love others. We naturally serve people. We naturally bring people to Christ. That's our job as Christians is to bring people to God. I'm way over time. There's way more to that than that, but that's the premise. <laughs> Do I have any questions?